the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do men say that the Son of Man is? And they, and they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the powers of death shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples, to tell no one that he was the Christ. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thanks to you, o Christ. Let us pray. Holy, gracious, and heavenly Father, we come to you this day with a confession on our lips that your Son is the Christ, that he is the Messiah proclaimed by your word, and we come here confessing that in our hearts today as well. Come confessing that not on our own, but because you have revealed it to us in your word, the same way you had revealed it to Peter. And so it is by the power of that word and the strength of your spirit that we make that confession. But Father, we need to know what that means in our lives. All of us here, those in the world whom you are seeking, need to know what that confession means. So we pray now that your spirit would open our hearts and our minds, that this word might be planted as a seed in our heart, that it might be watered by the gift of your word, and gathered here as two or three in the name of your son, and then by the strength of your spirit. Allow that to grow by your power, that you would give that word growth, and that we might have strength by your spirit to do your will in the world. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So as I was preparing this week, I was just reflecting on the gospel lesson, and something about this gospel lesson is actually pretty rare, and that got me to thinking about uh, some of the rarities that we see in God's creation. So in reflection on the gospel lesson, I kind of went uh, you know, over to the natural world that God created, and I reflected a little bit on some of the rarities that we see uh, in, in the world itself. So just wanted to throw a few things out here, a little bit early, get the juices flowing a little bit. Um, some of the rarities, uh, a lunar eclipse, an eclipse of the moon. Uh, anybody know, other than people who maybe taught science at some point, um, it, it, it happens a couple times a year. How many times a year might you see a lunar eclipse? Yeah, about two or three times a year. And actually, uh, yeah, two or three times a year, uh, a lunar eclipse at some point will come around. Uh, Haley's Comet. 96, maybe. No? 70, 75, yeah. 75 or 77, 75 or 76 years. For extra bonus pastor points, when was the last time we saw Haley's Comet? What year? 1984. No? Oh, Close. It was, no? it was the late 19, the 1990s. Close. What? 1986. Okay. According to Wikipedia, 1986 was the last time we saw it. If you do the math, when's the next time we're going to see Haley's Comet? <laughs> 2061 will be the next time Haley's coming. A rare occurrence. So if we know it's coming, we're going to be around, we might want to take a look at it. Uh, how about a blue moon? Know what a blue moon is? Hey, we say it all the time. Once in a blue moon. Because it's a rare occurrence. A blue moon is actually uh, when there is a second cycle of a full moon in one calendar month. You know how often that happens? No, close. No, once every two or three years. So a pretty rare occurrence. So therefore the expression, once in a blue moon. Uh, it's a rare thing that we know what's coming. We might want to go take a look at it. How about a solar eclipse? I don't want to talk about a rarity. A total solar eclipse. How rare is that? That if we were to see a solar eclipse, total solar eclipse, right here in Jacksonville, 
They happen a lot more frequently than this, but in any one location, to see it one time in one place and then another, the span of time for a total solar eclipse, a range of anywhere from 360 to 410 years, you are going to see a total solar eclipse in any one location. Now you want to get a little bit more rare than that, just because I was on the topic and I thought it was fascinating. Uh, a total solar eclipse that is more than seven minutes long is even more rare. In the time frame of 3000 BC, before Christ, to 8000 AD, they've done the calculations. Someone at NASA is a lot smarter than I am. Uh, they've done the calculations in that span of time. Uh, the longest solar eclipse uh, is going to be about 7 minutes and 29 seconds. You know what's going to happen? They've calculated out to the day. June 16th. You want know, to guess the year? 2186. We're probably not going to be around to see that one. But it's, uh, my point is, is that it's a rare occurrence. And that when it happens, it might be something that we want to pay attention because we might not ever see it again. I would argue that the gospel lesson is just, uh, I would say it's a greater rarity than any of those. Can you name anywhere in the New Testament other than this text here today where Jesus actually asks for the disciples' input? That's a rare occurrence. It doesn't happen anywhere else in the New Testament where Jesus is asking the opinion of the disciples. So it seems. I can really think of only one other place in Scripture where it, that, that might be even a, a, a faint precedent uh, in the Old Testament. Maybe Pastor Peacock has done some more research in. Maybe he can enlighten me a little bit. But the only other place I can figure out where God asked for input from one of his people was Solomon. When he was a young child, uh, taking over the throne of David, what shall I do for you, God says to Solomon. And just like Peter, he got the answer right at first until he started using his wisdom for, uh, for his own understanding, for his ways and his purposes. Um, it's the only other place I can think of. So this is a rarity in Scripture, and therefore God might be trying to tell us something, I don't know, foundational about the faith here. Being that it is so rare, this might just be important enough for us to pay attention to. So Jesus has been preaching and teaching nonstop, it seems, for three years, the whole of his ministry. Why ask now? Why at this point is he even contemplating asking the disciples for their input? Because to be honest with you, um, the disciples are in the habit of actually giving input to Jesus, aren't they? They are in the habit of commanding him when the 4,000 and the 5,000 came to him, Lord, send them away to fend for themselves. It's a command in the Greek. They really think they can tell Jesus what to do. <laughs> you give them something to eat. Jesus turns that around real quick. Not a good idea to give God input. Uh, maybe like we do in prayer. Trying to put God on the street. Trying to make deals with God. Do we do that in prayer? Try to change God in prayer when we are the ones who need changing. Not a good idea to give God input. And it's hard not to look forward to next week, isn't it? I know who gets to preach that text, but uh, you got to look forward to it. Peter's denied. You don't have to suffer, Jesus. Uh, trying to give Jesus input about what it means that he is the Christ, that he is the son of the living God, what that actually means Peter would actually deny that. Say, no, Jesus, you don't have to do that. So giving Jesus input, uh, he's not really looking for it, so why does he ask now? I'd argue it's because there's a context to it. You have heard it said a million times, if you've heard any of the pastors here preach, that context is what? Everything. Context means everything. So just a brief description of where Jesus has been and what he's been doing in the last two chapters. Feeding of the 5,000. Probably not five, more like 10 or 15, maybe even 20,000 uh, he's been providing for. When the most limited of resources were brought to him, he provided, and let's just say it wasn't enough when it was brought to Jesus. It was more than enough when it was brought to Jesus. 
He's been feeding. He has been providing. He had compassion on those people. The scripture says in the book of Mark, he had compassion on them. Why? Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. That's why he had compassion. So Jesus has been showing that he provides for the 5,000 and then the 4,000. And then in the middle of all that, kind of in between, he does this little thing like walking on water to the disciples. Stilling the storm when he got into the boat. Showing that he is in command of creation. That he is the one who made it. That he is the one who created it. He was the one through whom, as John says, all things were made. That he will give the provision. He will be the good shepherd. The one that will go to the cross for the sheep. He will be that shepherd. The, watcher, the one who watches over the flock. The one who even watches over the fishermen like the disciples were. So as he comes into Caesarea Philippi, the context is there. Not just in what Jesus has been doing, but in what is staring him and the disciples in the face. I know that Pastor Peacock has been to Jerusalem. You've been to Israel. And I believe you've taken this walk into Caesarea Philippi, if I'm not correct. If you go into Caesarea, I haven't been there, I've seen it on the web, maybe you should be preaching the sermon, not me, but I'll say secondhand, um, that as you walk into Caesarea Philippi, there is one of the biggest caves that you will ever see in your life. It, back in those days, in Jesus' day, it was called the Cave of Pan. Nickname, the Gates of Hell. So, in the Greek... <laughs> I know it says powers of death will not be overcome by that confession that Jesus... But in the Greek, it actually says it a little bit. The, the gates of Hades says it very literally in the Greek. That confession that Jesus is the Christ, not even this will overcome my name. The confession that I am Lord in your life. So we have this... Uh, Jesus has this... Uh, this reality of what the world would teach his disciples, what the world is trying to teach us even today here in 2014. It's staring them in the face. The world is staring us in the face, and it's got a lot of flashy, fast stuff out there that looks really good. It's going to tell us that it will provide for us. It's going to tell us that it will fulfill us. But it's a lie. It's something that doesn't fulfill the deepest needs of the human heart. So I would argue that Jesus isn't really asking here. He's teaching. He's teaching what it means that he is the Christ. What that will mean in the lives of the disciples as they witness and what that confession of Jesus as Christ will mean in our lives today. So the, the disciples saw Jesus feeding the five and the 4,000, walking on water. They saw the sick healed, the blind getting sight, good news preached to the poor. It's as if, Jesus was preaching in his actions about his identity. You know where he got that from? As he comes into his hometown and he goes into the synagogue, picks up the scroll of Isaiah. You remember this one, don't you, from Luke chapter 4? He came into Nazareth where, where, where he was brought up, went to the synagogue, pulled out the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, Open the book to the place where it was written that the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovering sight of the blind, to set liberty those who were oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. His identity. And then Jesus' next words. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled, filled up. Identify, here I am. It has been fulfilled in your hearing. So as Jesus is preaching about, the, telling his disciples, teaching them about his identity, not asking, but teaching them, the disciples have seen it. Peter has seen it, knows the scriptures as well as any, uh, as well as any Jew does. And so he sees the identity in Jesus and is bold enough to confess it. But as that cave of Pan is, is Staring them in the face. I got to think there was another thought in Jesus' head as well. You know what Pan was the god of in, uh, in Greek mythology? Not close. He was actually the god of, the, among other things, it may have been very, very well made in wine, but he's also the god of shepherds and flocks. Even fishermen looked after, uh, uh, praised him for their good catches. So here is this... Uh, 
Who's going to provide for them? Who's going, who is going to be the one to provide for those disciples? Who is going to be the one to provide for you and me and the challenges of our lives as disciples of Jesus, rejecting the ways of the world, bringing the challenges that that will? Who is going to provide for us? So Jesus is teaching them who will provide, who will protect, who will be our shepherd, who will give us life in the midst of darkness. So Jesus is not asking, but he is teaching. Who will prepare and pr prevail in our lives when, let's just be honest, when life seems like it's hell? When we go through that kind of suffering in our everyday lives. Who is going to prepare in that? The question for us is in the midst of this challenge, um, what confession do we hold fast to? Because when we are going through hell, it is the confession of Jesus as Christ that prevails. The world, uh, you, you see when Jesus asked the disciples, uh, who do men, who does the world say that I am? And let's just be honest, the list that they give isn't so bad. It's Elijah. Can you get better than Elijah? He's one of the prophets, Jeremiah, all good people that preach God's word. But did you notice that the world, what they've heard people saying about Jesus in the world, they want to call him anything but what he is. They want to give him credit for being a prophet, for being a good guy, for you know, doing a few good miracles, but they do not want to confess, will not confess, that he is the Son of God. The world will let us believe in Jesus, but it will do everything to muddle who he actually is. I was reading an article and then put it on my Facebook. I shared it with the pastoral staff. Uh, it's uh, about how our children are being raised because of what we are maybe preaching, that we are culpable for preaching a gospel that is not in the gospel, that our children are being taught about this thing. I know it's a big word, but it, it's called um, therapeutic moralistic deism. Yes. That's the big name for it. What it basically means is that well, we don't confess Jesus as Lord or the Christ, but that Jesus is our therapist. That Jesus wants nothing more than to make us feel good. <laughs> Rationalize everything. Therapeutic, moralistic deed. And I gotta say, there's some truth to what that article says. We are preaching to itching ears. Those that don't want to hear the gospel and make up their own. And the world like that will blind us to who God really, they'll let us believe in Jesus, but not let us see. We'll try to muddle the waters as to who he actually is. You won't hear that anywhere in the world, but you're going to hear it here in the word. You're going to hear, you heard it already in the meal. That it was my body and my blood given for you personally, for your sins and for mine. Thanks be to God. That is the Jesus that is the Christ. Not a therapist, but one who came to die for our sins. Not the therapist that came to pad our ego. Satan will even blind us to who Jesus is by suffering. He will mean it for evil, but somehow God in his glory uh, is able to take those blinders off, off of us when we go through suffering. Um, so when God doesn't give us the answers that we want to prayer, we, we might just think that God does not love us. In the midst of the challenges, uh, if you listen to the prosperity gospel, that if you're not getting what you want, that if your bank account isn't so big, if, if God doesn't seem to be bestowing his blessings on you, that there is no love for you, that you don't, maybe you just don't believe enough. Maybe you can work just a little bit harder and do that. Or if you're poor, the poor that we serve, there's a danger. They really might not think that God loves them because they don't have even the basics. Try teaching therapeutic, moralistic deism to someone in Peru. Doesn't fly. That they're not believing, that somehow their sin is greater than ours and they are in more darkness than we are. That doesn't preach. Tell that kind of theism, tell that kind of theology to a battered woman down at the Clara White Mission where the kids at confirmation camp went to minister. They saw women who were battered by those who should have loved them the most. What, can they, what do they know about God's love? Except that we bring it. 
those that were supposed to love them in an earthly love did. But yet we as the body of Christ have that gift, not of being a therapist, but as being a lamp to their feet and a light to their path. That's like no th when the therapist doesn't have the, when we breathe our last, when the loved ones that we minister breathe their last, no therapist on earth that can rationalize that away. It can make us feel better. They can make the sorrow go away. But there's a God that gives us hope. In the midst of the challenge, in the midst of the valley of the shadow of sin and death, we will fear no evil because he's with us. That's the gift that we have to give as disciples of Jesus. Peter got the answer right. That you are the son of God. But you have to admit, Jesus calls it. No, you kind of cheated, Peter. Well, sort of. He sort of cheated. It was, didn't get that on his own. He saw the word of God fulfilled. The father revealed it to him. It was a gracious gift, not because of what Peter did on his own, but because he believed the word that God provided. Peter saw, Thomas saw the risen Lord Jesus, and so they believed. When Jesus says something really odd about Thomas. When Thomas comes to him, sees the, hand, sees the marks in his hands, puts his hands in his side, you see and you believe, Thomas, right? Blessed are those who don't see and yet believe. That's the gift that you and I have. As uh, we come to this word and we take it by faith through the gift of the spirit that has been given in Christ. Peter and we get the answer right because we believe in God's word. And that is what we confess here. That even though we go through hell, even though sometimes life seems like hell, the confession of Jesus as Christ will always prevail. And you notice when, Jesus, uh, when Peter made that confession, Jesus seemed to make a pretty big deal out of it. Like perhaps it was the difference between life and death. Could that be that what we did in that confession and forgiveness just now, what was pronounced to us not by Pastor Peacock's authority, but by the authority of Christ given to us, given to the office of the keys, the key to the kingdom is to pronounce forgiveness. That unlock, that, it's not so much that it opened up the gates of heaven, as it unlocks the gates of hell where we all are. In bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves, that key has been given to us in Christ. That office is not just for pastors, but for you and for me, for all disciples of Christ. And it's a key that we will offer to everybody. We are called to offer it to everybody. That confession that Jesus is Lord, uh, Jesus makes a big deal about it because it is the foundation of the church, not Peter himself. But Peter's gone. His confession stands, revealed to him by the Father. That's the confession that you and I stand on 2,014 years later. It is the key that we have been given to unlock the gates of hell, and we will offer that to all. That is the foundation. That is that confession that Jesus is Christ. That is the core of our foundation. As a physical therapist, when someone comes to me with uh, back pain uh, uh, or even shoulder pain, um, you know, there's one thing that we always. If someone's going in for surgery, sometimes physicians will send us people to do core strengthening before they have surgery. A solid foundation for when they go through the trial. It's going to make a difference on the other end. That's the foundation that we have in Christ Jesus. We can try to get that from the world, but we only find it in the word. It's only, it's only revealed to Peter by God in his word. The Father is the one that has revealed this to Peter. You're not going to hear about Jesus and who he really is in the world. You're only going to get that from the word. From the, the word that is made flesh in the Lord Jesus. That's the confession that we, that we cling to. But so What? Jesus is Christ. He is Messiah. He is Savior. So what? In the midst of my challenges and your challenges, in the midst of your hell and my hell, when it seems like that in life, so what that Jesus is Christ? You've got to ask, what is hell? I mean, it's a valid question based on that text. What is hell? Yeah, people ask all the time what heaven is like, but what is hell? <clears throat> Being separated from God. That is the job of sin. 
when sin does its job well. It separates from God and from one another, and that sin has wages. Yes, the wages of sin is death, and it will work our way. It does work its way in our families as divorces happen, as families are divided, as health difficulties come upon us and we can't understand, the conflicts at work in, in, in our families, and when that death comes upon us and those we love. Sin having its way separating us from God. When we're going through that hell, it's the confession of Jesus as Christ that can prevail and does prevail. Just one quick example of that. I could name an example from any one of those and preach a long time about it, but uh, there's a woman who I was talking to uh, not so long ago. Two, three years ago, she was diagnosed with some pretty awful forms of cancer. Surgeries, chemo, radiation. Went through it all. Couldn't understand why the suffering. Why me? But yet in the years recently, when her daughter was diagnosed with cancer. Multiple kinds of cancer. Able to see her through the surgeries. The suffering that she had went through made sense in the context of the faith. Then when her sister found out she had metastatic breast cancer, stage four, went up and ministered to her in hospice up north. When you get the strength to, to minister the name of Jesus, when death is certain, God took that suffering and made good of it. And so now as she will travel to Texas where her best friend is, is having multiple medical problems, to minister to that person, the suffering kind of makes sense. But Satan intended it for evil, but God meant it for good. It's the story of Joseph. Couldn't understand why he was thrown into the pit by his brothers, by the ones that were supposed to love him the most. But yet, God used it for good. Does not cause the suffering, but finds a way. Is it really possible? All things work for the good for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. When our relationships, when our lives seem like hell, the confession of Jesus Christ is the one that prevails. And that confession means that we are forgiven. And so uh, one other question i got to ask myself. Is, is Jesus given us permission to withhold forgiveness? Is, is he really given us that permission? I, I would point to the answer in the prayer that we say right before the meal. Remember what we said right before the meal? Anybody? A thousand points. Lord's Prayer. As, as, yes, as. For, as, in the same way that we forgive, we're asking, don't forgive us unless we forgive others. We prayed that. We said that. The way the Lord taught us to pray. The sin is not to withhold forgiveness. The sin is to withhold offering it. Even to those that don't ask. Now, I wouldn't recommend someone who sinned against you. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend going up to them unless they've asked for it and tell them they're forgiven. That's not going to be real good. But Jesus says, uh, lest you forgive your brother from your heart. The forgiveness isn't for them. It's for you. You hold on to that forgiveness. You, you, you hold on to the sin. You hold on to the hatred, to the anger, the poison, the cancer that will build up within you. That forgiveness that we offer. We offer the key to everybody. It's like someone who's drowning. We can see them, their friends, family. You know, it's <laughs> Shame on us if we don't at least go try to save. They can kick us. The only way they're not going to be saved is if they push us away. If they reject the one that we're coming in the name of. But which one of us would not go to save our children who are drowning? So in the same way, we will offer that forgiveness to others the way it has been offered to us. Shining light on sin with the intent of forgiving that sin the way we were forgiving. The way through hell is forgiveness. That's the gospel truth. It's the key to the kingdom of heaven, restores our relationship with God and with one another. Because when we ourselves are going through hell, it is that confession of Jesus as the Christ that will prevail.
And I pray that blessing for you all this week. As you minister, go to people in the world, in your families, in your work, anywhere you go. I pray that blessing of forgiveness, that confession in your lives that Jesus is Christ. I pray that for us all, for you and for me, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take a moment to meditate on the word and the will of God.